Well, it's been really, really fun to get to know MZ and, and Justina and Rob and the team there. And what we're going to do is, what I'm going to do for a half an hour is give you a, <clears throat> an introduction to something we call the anthropology of HR, which sounds, I know it sounds a little odd, but I'll explain what it is. The where this all started was um, Rob and me having lunch in Oakland, but, but even before that, having looked at the human resources profession for a long time, it's extremely complicated and it's extremely important. And as an engineer at heart, I wanted to understand it because we wanted to try to provide information and tools and professional development. So we realized we could do some cool things. If we think about human resources as in, in sort of an anthropological way, in the sense that we uh, don't sit around with a bunch of PowerPoints and create stuff because we think it's a good idea. We look at the actual behavior of the animals. <laughs> we study them and where they're going and what they're doing and where they're migrating to and where they came from and which parts of the, of the community are growing and which parts of the community are shrinking. And if you think about that analogy, it really, really works for probably every profession. I think you could do this in IT and you could do it in sales. Sales is a little more complicated because it's so domain specific. But anyway, we set out to do this and with the MZ group and we've been doing it for, I guess it's been six or seven months and we're, we're really starting to learn some amazing things. I'm gonna give you a preview of what we've discovered and we will be producing a, <clears throat> a pretty good research report on this in the next month or so. And then um, we are in, in our academy using a lot of the information that we're um, gaining from this to um, help companies assess the state of their HR departments, to help individuals assess the state of their HR career. And then um, really for anybody in the profession to understand what they can do to make it better. So let me just start at the beginning. What is this all about? I don't know how many of you are in HR that are on this webinar, if a lot of you aren't. But HR is sort of a misunderstood domain. Uh, you know, in the old days, it used to be the personnel department and they basically paid people and sort of sat around and um, kept people from getting in trouble. In reality, it's changed a lot. Um, when I fell into it um, 20 some odd years ago, uh, I came into it as an analyst, originally started working in online training. I used to go out to companies and they would say, well, just tell me how GE does this because I want to copy how they did it. And then, um, then there was, tell me how Google does it, because I want to copy how they did it. And you know what? Those days are gone. You can't do that anymore. You really have to look at it as an innovation, an innovative function of business. Yes, you can copy and learn and share from many, many other companies, but the economy, the culture of each company, the industry you're in, the geographies you're in, the state of maturity, the age of your company, uh, the, the type of leadership team you have, your business strategy, those all impact your talent strategies. And now in the pandemic, we have this very asymmetric world of rapidly changing, some, to some degree violent issues. And I mean, I mean that in terms of the, the virus, not physically violent, um, that HR people have to respond to very quickly and technology, data, AI, and systems and digital tools are now you know, a, an integrated part of our lives. And so HR people really have to be very inventive and they really need to um, create great solutions much more quickly than ever before. They can't just uh, pick up and, oh, well, GE has nine box grid, let's just use that and everything will be fine. <clears throat> and by the way, GE isn't such a good example to follow anymore anyway, and look what happened to them. Now, we also know, for those of you that are in HR, there are some traditional um, uh, tribes or families of skills. And, you know, this is just, I'm going to show you the data and the real data in a minute. And when, when we went out and we started looking at the data with MZ, what we did with all of the tools that MZ has is, is we pulled all of the data about all of the jobs that are open in the United States and Canada. I think it was U.S. and Canada. And we started to group it by skills, by the inferred skills and the explicit skills required in all those jobs. And then we started to use cluster analysis to see, you know, how these 
um, roles worked. And we found that there were about 14 of these tribes. Now, the word tribe is sort of a strange word, but I think it's a really good definition. What these are is these are clusters of human beings uh, that do similar work with similar backgrounds, demanding similar skills. Um, and you're gonna recognize these if you look through these, um, you have these people in your company or you are one of these people. And to some degree you fall into one of these tribes because of your maybe where you came from, what you studied in school, the boss that you had, the job you were given. And you, you know, tend to become either a specialist or a deeper senior member of the tribe, or you move from tribe to tribe. And what we found is that some of these tribes are growing, some of them are sort of stagnant, some of them are highly strategic at a given point in time, like the one on the far right is really hot right now. Most of you in HR are not experts on public health. You will be by the end of next year, I guarantee you. Um, data science has been very big the last two or three years, HR tech, learning and development's been around a long time. Diversity and inclusion is peaking again. Um, so, so these things come and go. And so what we wanna do with this is not just you know, kind of write a book on it, but put in place an infrastructure so that we can <clears throat> continuously update it because I believe this is a never ending changing thing. And we need to think about it as a, an ongoing anthropology, just like in the real world of humans, we tend to move around and change and adapt. And you know, we live in different lifestyles and so forth. The same thing's true in HR. We have to respond to different economic issues, different technologies, different social issues. And one of the things that comes out of the research <coughs> is that these tribes have ge geographic locations. So, um, you know, for many years I had this, in fact, the MZ folks did this independently of me. We decided that a map is actually kind of a good way to visualize it because the, the two dimensional view of the map allows you to take each little dot, which is a skill um, and sort of cluster them together. And you can see which ones are adjacent to which ones. And you can see over here on the far right, the recruiters are very different. The recruiters are sort of more like salespeople, some of them. This little cluster over here is a bunch of salespeople. Um, and they tend to have very unique skills, but they use a lot of data. So they're very aligned. Very, they're closer to analytics than you might think. Uh, the learning and development people are up here, sort of in the high country, uh, you know, dealing with issues like skills development, skills assessment, training, training technology, and so forth. And they're very adjacent to people that do organizational development or very adjacent to people who are in the planning and human resource business partner role. Um, and then this big orange group down here, which is a little bit mislabeled, is um, you know, people that are generalists or specialists in team management, team leadership that do, you know, we call them performance management, but we're gonna rename that, who borrow from many of the skills on the top. And so I won't get into, and then of course over here we have the administrative roles of HR um, and all of the compliance benefits, pay, compensation and, and, uh, and, and payroll things. So it's interesting when you look at this, it's sort of intuitively obvious, um, but we don't, but you probably didn't realize it. And that, so what we're doing with MZ is we're basically mathematically clustering these and what we're gonna be able to say to you as a company or as an individual if you're over here in you know, Greenland and you wanna to get to Australia, you're gonna to have to take a couple of, you're not gonna make that in one flight. You're gonna to have to stop in a couple of cities on the way and it might take you more than a few hours to get there. And that's essentially what this profession is all about. There is a lot of overlap. It turns out when you look at the tribes um, and, and they're sort of showing them vertically here, um, there are many, many things in HR that are needed across all of the tribes. And this has been a big um, point that I've been trying to make in our academy is that we have to consider the HR profession as a multidisciplinary profession. You can't be a recruiting specialist without learning about DNI. You can't be a DNI specialist without learning about pay. You can't be a compensation specialist without learning about data 
and, and, uh, and equity and fairness and on and on and on and on. All of these uh, jobs or roles in HR are crossing each other and much more multidisciplinary, which is good for those of you that are in HR because your careers are getting more interesting and richer. Of course, uh, AI is to tending to automate some of the uh, routine work in, in HR, just like everywhere else, like background checking and stuff that you, know, you don't really need to do by hand anymore. Um, and so um, what we're learning is there's quite a bit of cross-pollinization and, and similarity between the tribes, but there are differences too. And so what we're, I won't go through all of this, but uh, we've, there's some certain things that are very, very common. The other thing that <clears throat> you, know, you have to think about when you think of skills, and this is a little bit different from the MZ uh, data, but having a skill doesn't turn you into a capable professional. The skills contribute to that, but you basically get thrown into a job or a role or a project or an initiative where you have to do something. And that's a, that is not always a perfect match with your skills. And in what we found, and this is something that I've um, spent a lot of time on in our academy, is that in the HR domain, there tend to be five types of roles or skills. There are specialist jobs where you're called upon to design something or implement something or execute something based on your specialization. Um, and there are a lot of them and they are always changing. There are business partners roles, the red, where you are specifically assigned and expected to work as a consultant. And yes, you need domain skills, but you really need to be a consultant first and a domain expert second. And you may spend a lot of time finding experts and bringing people together. Um, and so there's a whole new set of skills there. The third are people that do service delivery. Um, the people that design and develop employee experience solutions, case management solutions, technologies, service centers, huge amount of that in HR because many, many things that happen in the HR domain are transactional and serving the needs of an individual employee who has an issue and they just need it resolved. There are project and functional leader jobs where you're leading an initiative. I think this year, most of you have found yourself thrown into those jobs, a back to work program, a work from home program, a well-being program, a mental health program, a resilience program, a program for workforce transformation. These are things that are project leader, project manager, executive, and um, technical jobs. And then there's of course all the leadership jobs of HR and leading in HR is just like leading anywhere else, but it has its own unique issues in that HR leaders are oftentimes working with the board, with the CEO, with other very senior leaders, and they get involved in very difficult issues about the company and very issue, difficult issues about how to set up and run the function. <coughs> what I found in and sort of my experience with this is I think about it like engineering, it's, it's the equivalent of a full stack engineer. If you know the concept of a full stack engineer, a full stack engineer is somebody in, in the tech industry who knows the hardware, the operating system, the database, the middleware, the user interface, the front end, the HTML um, and so forth. You know, there are people that know all that and they're very hard to find, they're very important. And what's nice about somebody that knows all that is if there's a design issue or a problem, they can move around in the stack and figure out what needs to be done. I think for those of you that are in HR, you have exactly the same career. Um, you can't just be a domain expert and expect to have a rich career over a 50 year, you know, 40 year, whatever, how long your career is. You need to move up and down and become a good consultant. You need to understand the industry you're in. You need to understand technology and data and you need to understand uh, how to be and interact with leaders. <clears throat> now we, um, separate from MZ, and we're, we're, we're matching this now to the MZ skills. One of the things that I uh, discovered in my uh, world was that skills are not enough. Now I'm gonna talk about the difference between skills and capabilities in a minute, <coughs> but the word skill is a very, um, in fact, Rob is the one who told really gave me this idea in the first place. A skill is nothing more than a word. If your job rack says, must know Microsoft Excel, then Microsoft Excel is a skill. If the job rack says, 
must know statistics, then statistics is a skill. If it says uh, must know CFR 2111 regulations, then now that's a skill. So everything that's ever been written down in a job description is a skill. So if you look at the MZ skill database, which is 20 or 30,000, or maybe it's more than that, there's a lot of stuff in there. And, but if you actually look at HR people and what they do, yes, they use those skills, but they actually do and need these capabilities. So, so what we've been doing for the last year is building out a database, an inventory of actual capabilities, each of which require many of the skills in the MZ database. And we, I won't go through what all these things are, but we are <clears throat> currently, any of you in larger companies can assess yourself against these. We're gonna launch this out to the, you know, sort of the public world later in the year. But we've basically been assessing people against these 90 capabilities. Um, it turns out that if you, you know, sort of aggregate these up by these little boxes, you know, here's an interesting list of the relative um, need for these skills or capabilities amongst all the tribes. And it was sort of interesting to look at. Um, it's a little bit random how they all got organized, but um, it was odd to me that training and development was the most, you know, the most frequently requested of all, but it kind of makes sense because no matter what role you're in in HR, at some point you're <clears throat> trying to figure out the, whether this person or, or team or group or leader understands or has the capabilities to do the job they're in and what can we do to improve that? And that, that is fundamentally a training development thing. So anyway, you can look through this, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> now, you know, how do you decide where the skills are needed and what roles are needed? You know, one of the things that's critical in the HR profession is what is called HR transformation. <clears throat> in every HR department, let me just clear my throat. I'll just go on mute for a sec. Every HR department I've ever talked to is in some form of transformation. And at a high level, basically what happens to HR departments is they go through these three stages. In your small company, you start as a little group of people and you just do a bunch of stuff. You hire people, you pay people, you get a 401k program going, you get a payroll system, etc. And then, oh, we need somebody to do sales training. Oh, we need somebody to do recruiting in Europe. Oh, we need somebody to handle payroll in another country. And you start to build these little groups that do specialized things in different parts of the company. And then it becomes kind of chaotic. And you suddenly realize, wow, we have five different onboarding programs. We have you know, four different learning platforms. We have three different payroll systems. It kind of is a mess. And so there's this, period where companies say, okay, let's rationalize it into an integrated strategy. Um, and that is a common, common thing that companies do as they grow. You buy a company, they have an HR department, they have a different system, they have different people doing different jobs. So you bring this all together. <clears throat> then you find out after you've done that, that's all well and good. We've now created highly efficient HR. Now we need to be more consultative again. And so you redistribute HR into a more uh, what I call business optimized model. And that ends up turning into what we call the HR operating model. The reason I show you this, not because I wanna get into it, I don't really wanna get into the details of this, but what you see here is basically roles. And um, what's changing right now in HR at a very rapid rate is the fluid nature or uh, liquid nature of the roles. You may be a, an analytics guru and you may, may be responsible for creating surveys, but all of a sudden you got thrown onto a team that's working on a well being program and you have to assess well being. And then you're doing uh, attestation for the virus. And then you're looking at executive uh, you know, feedback and crowdsourcing of data for the executive meetings that happen every Friday. And all of a sudden you're doing you know, four or five things that are adjacent to what you did before. And what we need to do as a profession and what we're trying to do in our academy is, is really give you as, a, as an individual or as a company, the tools to figure out who should be going into which of these boxes and, and when. And one of the things that's very new in HR is this green box, which is the pool. If you look at the direction of 
organizations and companies in every domain, both, you know, not just in HR, we're becoming more um, like consultants. We do different things than our job description said uh, because the company's changing and the nature of work is constantly changing. And so more and more of the jobs in HR are cross-functional jobs. And if you wanna make more money and get ahead or become an executive or a leader, um, you need to become more cross-trained. And that's really what's going on in the, in the domain. Now we did some research with IBM, it's being introduced on Friday. And we looked at uh, the business performance of different models of HR. And when we did the research, it was before the pandemic. So the data's probably changed, but I'll give you a sense of it. Um, we basically found that HR departments are kind of in four groups. There's those that are mostly administrative. There's those that are mostly focused on uh, formal talent practices and very sort of like in that middle orange part of the chart I showed you earlier. There are those that have turned themselves inside out and said, we're all about the people. We're all about the employees. We're all about productivity. We're gonna get involved in job design and work design and workplace design and so forth. And then there are those that really operate like business consulting groups and they do mergers and acquisitions and reorganizations and coach leaders on business transformations and workforce planning. Now we'd all like to do that stuff at the top, but that other stuff has to get done too. And what you see is around one, 11, you know, one in 11 companies in our surveys were at the top, you know, and about a half to two thirds are at the bottom too. And that the ones at the top are working in companies that are growing much faster. Well, you look at all the details about what these companies are like, and there's all sorts of details as to what they do, but the uh, practices that correlate moving up on this model are here. These are the 10 practices that are most highly correlated. The one that is the most highly correlated with the level three and level four companies is the operating model of the function of HR. How are you set up? Do you have people in the right roles so that they can do the right things with the right skills to execute as a strategic uh, partner to the CEO and other business leaders, as opposed to getting bogged down in administration. And one of the things you find is if you look at the amount of money and effort spent on the training and development of HR in those four um, categories, the level three and level four companies are spending almost twice as much money on the capability development of HR. Now I'm not here to you know, oversell that story, but I think we all know this, that if we're not developing our organizations, we're probably falling behind. If we're not developing our capabilities in HR, we're also falling behind. So let me sort of close up on one discussion point on this idea. So MZ's database is probably the world's most credible, complete, interesting database on skills. There are many skills databases out there. Virtually every HR technology vendor uh, claims to have a skills engine. What they don't have is the data behind it. I mean, Workday and Degreed and all these companies have inference engines that can kind of scrape data from whatever your HR system is and try to in, you know, kind of infer what they think the skills are of an individual. But that's not that useful if you don't have a lot of data. Um, and if all you have is one company's data and it's not in one place, you're not gonna get that much out of it. What MC has, of course, is a vast, uh, large library of that. Um, and, and, and they um, can be used to develop the capabilities. And let me, let me just sort of give you a you know, final little thought on how this all comes together. Cause I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, on the left side of the picture in most companies, including in HR and every other domain, you know, you get a job description. We go out and find somebody, you write down the job description. We need somebody to do this, 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 and this. And they will go to this school and we want them to have this kind of experience and so forth. And then of course, when they actually come to work they don't really do that. They do other things. And so they have roles. The roles are you know, usually similar to the job description, but they vary. And sometimes you have multiple roles. I was just on the phone with SAP this morning and they actually have a very active, what they call job sharing model, where at SAP, you can take a job and say, I'm gonna be in this job 70% of my time, but I wanna spend 30% of my time on this other job. And they actually formally assign you that so you get to do two things. Um, 
which I think is kind of cool. I mean, that's kind of where the world is going. Anyway, so in each role, you have these capabilities, which I showed you earlier, that are the business capabilities. Like if you're in sales, you need to know, know how to qualify customers or prospects. Well, qualifying a prospect is not a skill. I mean, it's a lot of skills. You need to know how to ask the right questions. You need to know how to listen. You need to interpret answers. Uh, you need to know um, how to, you need to know something about the business and the industry that the person's in and so forth. So there's capabilities. And so then the skills make that up. And I think this is a good way to think about it. And what we're basically doing with MZ now is we're building for HR, not for the whole company, this, uh, ecosystem of how to manage these tribes. The tribes exist for many reasons. Some of the tribes are historical. Some of them come from where people went to school. Listen, if you were a teacher and you went into business, you got put in the training department, you were a trainer, you were standing up in front of a classroom, then somebody turned you into an instructional designer, then you went and learned a lot of tech. The next thing you know, you're an instructional architect. That, that's a tribe. You fell into that tribe because of how you got there. And so what, we, what we're here to do to help you deal with all this is assess where you are, benchmark yourself against other organizations, look at the roles and the jobs you have and the skills associated with those jobs, and then fix it if it's not working. And one of the things that's so cool about working with MZ is they have this you know, huge library of tools that can help you figure it out because sometimes it's city by city, country by country, state by state. You know, in this country, if you create a tribe of people analytics in this city, it's going to be a small tribe because there aren't that many people there. Um, so, so sometimes this gets into uh, how you design the organization, where you put the people, where who you hire from, uh, what schools or other locations you hire from, with the ultimate goal of these four things on the left. Are we set up correctly? Do we have the right courses and content and skills and capabilities in the team? Do we have the right level of mentoring and coaching? By the way, one of the things that comes out of our uh, capability assessment from the companies that have taken it is the number one requested uh, development process that people want is a mentor. They don't want more courses. They actually, that's the third thing they want. The first thing they want is a mentor and then projects, assignments, stretch assignments, new things to do. Give me something, give me a project to work on in this. I really want to get better at it. As long as I have a mentor, I'm more than willing to jump in. Those are the things we want to help you do. And that's what this is all about. Um, just out of sort of for interesting, a uh, little bit of feedback in the data we've collected so far, these are the things people want in HR the most, these top five things. Um, and the areas where they feel the most insecure are on the bottom. People don't feel comfortable with facilities and workplace safety yet. DNI is an amazingly difficult area of HR. Most HR professionals do not feel that confident that they know what to do. Uh, analytics, HR service delivery, uh, project and product management and agile solution design. We're, we're, as I said earlier, more and more HR people are starting to feel like product managers and less like um, you know, service delivery people. And then, of course, all the issues of well-being, social responsibility, and so forth. Those are all areas where people are really, really growing. Here's the, here's the data on what people want. And you can see the number one most desired developmental opportunity is mentoring and coaching. Number two is more responsibility, which you know, is really one of the best ways to learn. The number three is events, sharing with other people. And number four is courses. So, uh, so this isn't a... Uh, domain of just throwing out more content. And I've been talking about this for years is that, you know, throwing out a bunch of content is might make you feel better, but it doesn't necessarily improve the capabilities of your company. So anyway, that's, that's what we're doing with MZ. I, I, I have to, first of all, I want to thank Rob in particular for getting me looped into the organization. Justina and the other folks at MZ that we work with have just been incredibly intelligent and interested and uh, passionate about this. We will uh, produce a report on this uh, to help you as an HR professional or as an HR uh, organization. And if you're not in HR, you're probably gonna find it interesting anyway, because it's probably got a lot of stuff in it. You can use it for your domain. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, helping any one of you individually as a company or as an individual if we can too. 
Um, thank you, Rob, for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Josh, if you stop sharing, we have a few questions. And uh, I think, Justina, we're going to have pop on here as well.